Hello everyone, Karen Griffiths here. Now I've had a subscriber comment or a question and I thought that's a really good idea and instead of answering it as a comment I'm going to answer it as a video because it gives me the opportunity to explain a little more and actually share with you a technique as well. So the question was, Kerry, can I have a look at the photographic background you use to create your thumbnails and your images for social media? Yes, no problem at all. Um, now, I've always found it really important as a content creator to obviously focus on the quality of the YouTubes I put out, but whether the quality is good, bad or indifferent, you're never going to watch that video unless the YouTube thumbnail, the thing that you scroll past, stops you scrolling. And I mean, I've had a YouTube channel now for over 13, possibly 14 years now. And at one point I discovered that if I made the YouTube thumbnails more eye-catching, more of you stopped to watch the content and it made it worth me making the videos in the first place. So I went back through all of my videos, over 500 of them, created as many thumbnails as I could to go with the projects. But what my process normally is, is I will film a video then as soon as I've made the final product, I will put it onto a background, photograph it, and then that becomes the thumbnail. Now granted, I go in and I tweak the alignment and things like that in Photoshop. Sometimes it's a dark day, I'll brighten the image up a bit. Um, also with my videos, as you know, I will edit out anything that I think is unnecessary or a repetitive skill or what I perceive as boring, although you never seem to think it's boring, but you know, we all have different ideas. So anyway, back to the background things. So what I wanted to do is I want to show you samples of the ones that I use, explain what they're made from, and then I'm going to switch the camera around and we're going to make a new background because I need a new background for my gel plate images. So without further ado, let's get on with this. So I tend to use foam core or stiff cardboard to mount stuff on so like this one okay I've got a feeling feeling this this must have been a plastic coated um, photo backdrop from something and all I've done is I've taken a bit of the white card and the foam core the stuff that's got the foam down the middle um, I only use that because it's a bit more robust sometimes than the thin cardboard and uh, as you can see I've use packing tape to hold it on the end and I think I've probably got some spray adhesive underneath that one so that's just a general go-to to be honest with you. Um, next one similar thing except it's a bit bigger foam core again this again at one point um, these fabric backgrounds you could buy them on the internet and hold them up and then take photographs to get them were really really popular and I tended to buy a few of them but instead of using for them for their intent I cut them down and mounted them so it just could be options. Another one as you can see um, wooden, wooden slats work really well for me so I tend to use them. This one might actually be sticky back plastic or like um, a vinyl, a vinyl that's sticky back for maybe a kitchen. Um, here's another, actually this one, okay, this is on just thin card and as you can see, it's very flexible. This one I think is, is maybe outliving its use. I don't use this one too often. So I think I'm gonna recycle the backing and get rid of this one. It doesn't sort of go, go with the style that I do. Um, oh, this was another one. I bought this, on the internet. If you go to places like eBay or Amazon and you put in photographic backgrounds, sometimes you'll see things like this. They come from China. Um, one thing that really annoys me is instead of rolling them up and mailing them in a tube, they fold them. So then you've got to try and deal with crease marks. Um, I managed to get the most of these out, but I just mount them onto this, this foam core and that gives me an interesting background. And there's their intent for photographic backgrounds. I don't think I'm breaching any copyright anywhere. Um, here's another one that I purchased on the internet. Now these are normally quite long sheets. So some of them may come as a two part. I've got a feeling, where's it gone? I've got a feeling this one and this one were both from the same piece and I cut it in half. I made two out of them because I don't need a backdrop 
to be four or five feet tall. I'm just doing an overhead shot of a small item that I've made or a collection of items just to actually make it more interesting. And like if I put something on Pinterest or social media, I will use these. It's a far better quality image if I put it on one of these backgrounds than if I've got it on my kitchen counter or I've got it on my dining room table and there's there's still stuff from the day's work on there. Sometimes there is a time and a place for like a workbench photograph or if I'm in a process of painting something I'll take a picture of it in situ with all the paints around it but a lot of the time I like to keep things nice and neat and tidy and as professional as I can. Oh here you go. You Guess what Kerry's lucky, lovely colour is? I like blue. I do like blue. I like blue a lot. Um, however, it doesn't always have to be that professional. Okay, this... Oh, picked up two. No, I picked up one. This is just a really thin piece of card from my craft store. And I want to say this is either A2 or A3. Craft card in colours. You usually buy it on the shelf. You buy it per piece. I liked the colour brown, so I mounted it on this card. I've got a grey one as well somewhere. I can't remember where that one is. Um, and I use those a lot. So if I just want a plain, nondescript background, that's how I do it. Um, my favourite one, however, and you've seen this one often, right? Again, a piece of card. And what I did with this one is I took old book pages and I just collaged old book pages all over it. And for me, this is perfect because this fits any sort of journaling that I'm doing, anything that I'm doing with ephemera, it just gives me an option. I could really have done one with music on it, I could have done one with old book page, I could have done one ledger, but this, this, and this is a big one, I say this is A3. I use this one a lot, and if you look back through my thumbnails, you will see I use it a lot. Okay, this one raises a lot of questions. Where did I get this from? This recycled bit of foam core, this was actually a wallpaper sample from an old wallpaper sample book. Um, and I love this one. I mean, I, do, I wouldn't want it as wallpaper in my house. However, I like the way this is. It really works for me. Um, it's just interesting talking about wallpaper. This is just a regular bit of... Can you catch the light on it? There you go. It's that nasty wallpaper that nobody likes. Um, that sort of chipboard paper. I happen to have a spare piece of it, but sometimes this is just enough interest in the background not to distract from the focal point, which is whatever the picture is meant to be made from. This one again, this is another favourite of mine. Um, this is another wallpaper sample. If you can ever get yourself one of those big wallpaper sample books, grab it because in there is a whole load of different wallpapers you could conceivably use for backgrounds without it always looking like wallpaper if you know what I mean. It's like this next one. This wallpaper, I don't know what it would be wallpaper for, um, maybe a study or a bathroom maybe, but I like this. I mean, it was annoying that I didn't have the other squares, but I tend to put my item in the middle and then photograph it there so you don't always see that that bit's missing at the top, but really, really handy. Um, which brings me around to what I'm going to do next. Um, I have got myself, I will say this is A2. What size are my boards? My boards are over. Right, this is an A2 piece of foam core. I was going to buy regular card, but Hobbycraft, believe it or not, did not have the thickness I wanted. But these were on deal. How many were there? I want to say there's three of these for four pound. And I thought, you know, that, that's fine. And when I got to the cash register, believe it or not, I had a coupon for five pound anyway. So in my mind, these ended up as free. So I'm going to be making one of these into a new background. And what I want to do is... I have a load of gel print scraps, like we're talking loads and loads. In fact, there's an entire drawer filled behind me. And I thought, I don't have anything that's sort of an arty background. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get matte medium, going to pull up my scraps, choose a random selection of them, glue them all over it. I think I'm then going to do a little bit of dry brushing on them with white gesso just to knock them back so they're not too dominant and then that will become a new background so um either you can stop watching now because you've now found out what the topic of the video is or grab yourself a cup of tea grab a cup of coffee get a chocolate bicky slice of cake bit of pie whatever you fancy really 
and sit down and I'm just going to make, make a new one for myself. I thought, take you along on the journey. We can have a chat while I'm doing it. And I thought it might make a fun video. So um, give me a couple of seconds. I just need to set up, get up and get on with it. See you in a moment. So here we are at the messy mat and I've put the messy mat down because obviously I'm going to be using media. But I don't want to get my nice, my nice clean mat dirty. This is one I do the messy stuff on. OK, before we even start, um, just to reiterate what I've just said, um, when I use card or any sort of item to stick stuff down with, I would normally use double sided tape or a spray adhesive. I don't normally use a wet medium, but because I'm going to stick down um, gel prints, I'm going to need a wet medium um, and I'm using what's called a water resistant tissue. So these have been done. These are meant for like building carnival floats and stuff like this. So they're water resistant tissue paper. You can do this with napkins. You can do this with tissue paper. You can do this with gift wrap. You just need to respect the medium you're sticking down as to how brutal you can be. I've chosen to use wet strength tissue paper because it's more robust when I'm working and work quicker and therefore I don't take a long time to do it. Now, so this is another concern. As you can see, I'm not going to be able to get this on the entire screen. So I'm going to be turning it and moving it um, basically so you can see it. Now, um, I have never stuck anything with a met medium onto this surface. And this feels like almost a plasticky coating. So what I did is I came in and I used clear gesso and gave it a coating of clear gesso. It resulted in something, however, if I can get this to you, you may or may not be able to detect this ended up curved. I, mean, I don't think you can see it, but trust me when I say that this is no longer straight. So what I did is once this side of clear gesso went on and was dried, I then put another coat on the other side and guess what? It straightened it back up again. So note to self, I'm putting a coat of clear gesso on. The moisture will make the foam core warp slightly, but putting it on the other side means it will it will balance it out and warp it back the other way and it'll end up straight. I haven't I haven't had that problem when I'm using card or wood or anything like that. So as I said, we're on the learning curve here. So Let's see. Um, actually, I did have it the right the first time around. So, um, yes, I coated it in clear gesso. Another reason I use clear gesso, my clear gesso has got a bit of a texture to it. So it means things are likely to stick to them um, without peeling off. I could have used something like a glue stick or something like that. But I know within not long at all, it probably peel off. I'm going to be use, using Liquitex Matte Gel Medium. I, I'm using matte because I don't really want anything shiny on here because when I'm taking a photograph, I don't want to see a reflection of any metallics. So that was one concern. I'm also using one of these Distress brushes by Ranger or Tim Holtz. And purely because it's a bigger brush for me to hold, I could easily have used a decorating brush to do it. And the other thing I have here is I've got a ceramic tile, a smaller one, which I'm going to put the medium on just because it's easier than messing up a palette. Now, I do have an idea for this because remember, this is meant to be a background. So I've gone through my gel prints and I pulled out a whole load of stuff that I think could be classed almost as a neutral because I want this to be the background. I don't want it to pull focus. I have pulled out little bits like this was a clean off tissue purely because I don't mind the little bits of colour in there occasionally, but I do want to make it so that the feature is the thing that is sat on it to be photographed. I can't pick these up now. Um, so I've gone for browns and kinds of neutrals. I pulled in some white as well, just in case I want to null it all down a little bit. But my intent is when it's fully dried, I'm probably going to come in with um, white gesso or white acrylic paint and I'm probably going to dry brush it to once again push it into the background. I have also pulled out a few scraps because I quite like the idea of the old bit of green and a bit of brown in, in this as well. Just trying to keep it relatively relatively neutral. So I think we just need to get on with it really. So I'm going to pull this over here and put some of the gel medium out onto this tile. Now you're probably not going to see this tile 
ever again because I'm going to push it over to one side so it's out of shot so I can hopefully share with you as much as possible. Now, wet strength tissue paper likes to tear in one direction but doesn't like to tear in the other direction. Um, so you could cut it. Um, I'm not for this. I'm just going to get it stuck down. So I'm going to take my medium and start in this corner. I like when I create stuff to start in the corners because then it's done. It's out of the way and it, it's, it's just where I like to start. That's all got that one in there. Now, um, if you were using napkins or tissue, um, you can do this. Just as I said, be really, really careful because if you brush napkin or um, gift wrap tissue too much, you'll end up just destroying it and it will break down. So there's another thing to consider when creating one of these. You're not creating a piece of art. OK, um, yes, it's nice to have some aesthetics to it, but remember that maybe it's not even going to be seen in the long run. And uh, the things on top of it may take up more space. Why well, can't I unfold you? There you go. Um, may take up the majority of the space. You may only see maybe a small slither of this. Um, just because that's, that's what it's for. It's a background. So don't get overly worried that, oh, I can't see it. I'm not going to, it doesn't look right to me. It's just literally wallpaper. I mean, that's probably why I, I like using wallpaper as well. I'm trying to work the bubbles out of this. I don't mind too much if there's creases or crinkles in it because, as I said, I'm going to dry brush this afterwards if I think it needs it needs to be a little paler or maybe some of the colours are a little bit too dominant. So I will dry brush it afterwards. There's a lot of medium on there. I've gone a little bit berserk with the medium, guys. Let's see if I brush some of that off. I'm hoping that the medium won't make it curl again. If it does, I will just put another layer of medium on the other side. But in there lies an option for you too. If you're using foam core like I am, you could easily um, do another design on the other side of the same piece of foam core. So you're getting dual purpose out of your piece of foam core. Um, I know I'm going to be asked, why do you need to mount it? You don't need to mount it. Um, I tend to stack my backgrounds vertically, um, almost up against like a wall in my workshop. And, and therefore they stack better if they're actually on a more robust surface like this. But I mean wallpaper, I have rolls of um, samples of wallpaper and I will very often just unroll it, lay it on a flat surface, hold it down with a little bit of a weight in each corner and then take the photograph and then roll it back up again. So you don't need to back it. I back mine because I prefer to. And I'm sharing that with you because I was asked to share how I did it. So, map medium all over the place here. So right, I've got my corners established. Sorry it's all flicking around. It is just going to be the way it is. Right, I've wanted some green and I've got this. So I'm going to bring some of this in. Um, Let's do a few strips of this actually. Uh, let's do a couple of squares. So um, there are so many different options for making backgrounds for photography, for your YouTube thumbnails, or even say you're sharing your work on Pinterest, something like that. Um, it just looks better. Um, you have more of, a, more of a beautiful image to look at than if you just leave it on the carpet to photograph it or or something like that. So just always bear in mind that your post or your image or your video is likely to be shared more by people if it's beautiful. And part of that beauty isn't just what you've photographed on it. It's what it's lying upon. It's getting a bit sticky there. Let's see if I stick a bit of this down. Now, I know this is going to take um, quite a bit of matte medium to do because it's quite a large surface. I know someone is going to ask me, could I use Mod Podge? You could, but Mod Podge is expensive or Mod 
pod, sorry, is expensive. Um, I probably wouldn't use it. And there's another reason why I probably wouldn't use it as well. It will give you a kind of a shine or a sheen. Even the matte one gives you sort of almost like a leathery finish to it. And that may translate into a reflection. And what I'm trying to do is to create a matte surface to put stuff on. And that matte surface will then focus everything on whatever is upon it. So I need some more matte medium. So see, we're building up quite quickly. Now I think that's enough of that design. I'm going to pull in a few of the scraps that I've got to one side. Um, you don't need to do horizontal and verticals. You can do whatever your style is. My style happens to be horizontal and verticals, but yours doesn't need to be. And as you can see, I'm not worried about straight edges on things. I'm literally just putting stuff down. Now, some of them, as you can see here, are sticking over the edge because maybe I didn't cut it correctly in the first place. Doesn't bother me. I will go in afterwards, flip this over, use maybe an X-Acto knife or something and just trim it to the right. Um, trim it so it's flush with the edge. I think this bit along here will be nice. Now this is also something else you can do. Oh, that's my neighbor's dog now, it's not biscuit for once. Um, something else you can do, you could incorporate into this background your logo if you have one. If you've got a recognizable symbol that represents you or your business name or anything like that, I would avoid, and I only know through experience because I did this mistake, um, some of my backdrops did carry my web address and um, what else was it? My web address, my social media, stuff like that. But then came the time I changed my social media and I changed to a new website. And of course, all of that imagery then had to be changed to keep it updated. So just be aware that if you're gonna put stuff on here about yourself, then you need to make sure it's going to stay current um, or make the effort to make it current. Put this stuff over the top. Yeah, you can hear the dog in the background from my neighbour because it's an absolutely stunning day here in Wales yet again. Although looking at the sky looks a bit thunderhead to me. I think we could be in for a storm later on. Um, I could have sworn I heard thunder late, uh, earlier on this afternoon, but may maybe it was just me having a moment. I wouldn't be at all surprised. I think that piece can go on here. So now, um, if you're a bit worried about ooh, what colours do I use, um, what, what should I stick on, what shouldn't I stick on, I would say try to stay with colour families. So if you stay with like warm tones, then it will all work. If you stick with cool tones, then the cool tones will work. So, and by that I mean um, cool tones are pretty much uh, blues, violets, greens, purples, although in saying that some purples can actually be regarded as um, a cool, they can actually be regarded as a warm if they've got a red base to them. And then of course, the red family is things like yellows, oranges, reds, that, that sort of thing. I, I would, if you have not looked at a color wheel, uh, just Google or go onto Pinterest and look up color wheel or color theory, and you, you will see um, what I'm talking about there and then. And, and it will just help you sort stuff out in your mind as to what goes what with what. And if you stay with one of the color families, then it should be that everything you add works together. And I say should because there are no guarantees in life. 
Um, I'm probably going to, once I've made this one, which is going to be a neutral one, I'm probably, maybe even on the other side of this, and no, I won't be filming it, um, I'm probably going to do a cool, cool one, and I might do a warm one, so that I've got different backgrounds for, depending on what I'm photographing. So, say I was doing something of an underwater nature in a piece of art or a piece of ephemera, then maybe I might want to put it on a cool background or I may want the contrast of a warm background behind it. So it just gives me options is where I'm trying to go with this. Gosh, this is fiddly trying to do this without, with keeping you in shot. I do apologize if I occasionally slip out of shot. It's not my intention, it's just, it's a little bit tricky. So, so what else can you use? Okay, we've talked about using napkins, tissue paper, you can use rice paper, you can use, um, good grief, you can use so many things. You could even make one of these as a, as a board of digitals. So you went on and you put digitals down and basically made it one enormous masterboard. I mean, I've, I've done that as you saw in the previous section I actually did have um, one one that was all different bits of book page down on there so yes you can do that and um, wallpaper paste uh, wallpaper samples is a really good one what else what, what else can you put on here um there's just so many it's anything you can stick down or lay down I mean I do know a lot of journalers who have got like a lace tablecloth or something they will lie down to photograph the journals against, um, anything like that. Just, just try to make it interesting in the background. I think that's the only thing sometimes people miss. They, they literally just go, oh, it's okay, I'll just photograph it in the kitchen up against the tiles, I like the tiles. Well, it, everyone can tell it's your kitchen. Um, go, go to a charity store. Or go to a Goodwill and maybe pick up some some curtains or pick up maybe there's there's a duvet cover or something like that there I need a bit of a more more I'm using scraps now and I'm not using the stuff so I think I want to add some warmth into this I want neutrals that that I've already said but I did want the odd pop of something and I don't mind the black on this going in there either, because as I said, I'll dry brush over the top of this when I'm finished. I, think I don't need all of that. Um, so yes, uh, things like interesting designs. I mean, if you, if you are someone who paints or draws, maybe create a piece of art that you use as your backdrop. And that piece of art is always used as your backdrop. And therefore, your subscribers will get used to that and then they will know at a glance that it's your your video or your piece of art and then they'll click on it because they already subscribed to you and they like you. Well, we hope they like you. So so just a few hints guys, just a few things that might might make um your thumbnails stand out from the maddening crowd, should we say, because there are now so many YouTube channels out there, um, so many Pinterest accounts that you really do need to somehow find a way of having your head above everybody else. And whether that's a nice logo, whether it's a backdrop for your thumbnails, whether it's your face, because don't underestimate the fact that people nowadays like to know who the YouTuber is content creators are a lot of the time in the past we we were reasonably anonymous facially we we just used to make the content and put the content up and let it speak for itself but trends have changed and um, I've definitely found that people like like to know who you are they want to look you in the eyes should we say you you get where I'm going with this people want want to like you they want to know you're a real person they they want to feel that you're a friend of theirs um and that's important that is very much important and it's 
it's worth not underestimating that. So I've got a bit of paint stuck on here that needs to come off. There you go. It was just a bit a big old lump. I'm not I'm not going to try and deal with that later. Um, right, so I've got smaller pieces here. Let's pull in. We've got quite quite a colourful array. I think I want to pull in something now like this. This this will calm things down a bit. And I think now I'm going to come in and do some final pieces. Remember, this is not a piece of art. It is a background. So it's literally, I'm making a quilt of images and I've lost the paintbrush. I've lost the paintbrush. Oh, there it is. Yeah, typical, I lose the paintbrush halfway through. Right. Um, doesn't need to be that wide. Let's take that strip off. I don't mind if it's a bit wonky. That's okay. Yes, that will go lovely there. Um, what else can you use? I have in the past used things like, um, what's it called? I call it sticky back plastic. Um, I think other countries call it sticky back vinyl. Um, things you cover cabinet doors with or sometimes you cover kitchen surfaces with it. It's it comes on a roll and you it's glued on the back already for you. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I'm absolutely certain you know what I'm talking about. The only thing with that is if you're going to use that, obviously you're going to stick it to something. I would then put a coating of matte medium over the top because there's a very definite shine to it. Um, and maybe you don't want that because of course shine will create um, light bouncing around which will be really quite distracting. I've got one little bit there and then this half is done. Just pop that one in there. Right, I don't mind that little bit there. I might come back to it if I feel I need to. Right, I had strips didn't I? I think if I take that off about there, are you in shot? You are in shot. Um, I wouldn't, after you've done this, seal it or varnish it because, first of all, you're using matte medium, which means it's already sealed down anyway. I'm using matte medium for the sole purpose of not having a shine and a varnish would have a shine. So just just be a little cautious if you're going to reach for something and you think you need to seal this. You don't. And if it gets damaged, that's fine. Put a patch of another gel print over the top of the damaged piece. It's, it doesn't, doesn't really matter because it's an ongoing thing. You After you've used it for maybe a year, you might decide that you want to do something different. Come in and add different elements over the top of it. Right, got that, got that, got that. I wonder whether I want to use this a little bit. See, if I hadn't have seen that little white piece there, I wouldn't have had to do something about it. But the way my brain is wired, I've now got to do something about that. Right, so I've just got these pieces to go. I don't want to use use this one because it's so close to the others. Right, there are little bits of blue in here, but that doesn't feel right. Actually, here you go. This was just a clean-up sheet. Um, probably just cleaning off the gel plate as I was working. So I can take a piece of that out of there. And that will cover that strip there for me. Oops, sticky. Um, another thing that I, I've done in the past too is I've taken washi tape and stuck strips of washi tape for the entire thing. Now, 
I know someone in the comments is going to say, well, Kerry, what about copyright? You don't own the right to that image. I'm not selling this background. It is purely the washi tape has been used to create an image, and that image is going to be behind something else that I've created. I'm not selling the background. I, I don't need a license for it, as far as I'm concerned. So just, just, I suppose, do a bit of research in your own country, because maybe there are different rules that I'm unaware of. But I've never worried about the, the imagery in the background of my print, of my photographs, because it's firstly just, I don't charge for it. I'm not making any money from it. It's not even that there's that amount of it to be seen that um, is going to cause a problem. I'm just doing a last little look. I think you can just about see this. I'd like those air bubbles to have gone, but I'm not overly picky. I think I want to break this piece up here. I'll pop a piece of this in there. Only because I've got a bit of um, matte medium left and I just want to use it up. Because that's the disadvantage of one of these. You can't get the lid off and you can't put it back in. Um, I did used to keep a little pot that I kept the spare in. But then it started drying out and you know the story by now. Right, where I pulled that bit of black off needs a little something as well. Go on there. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to wait for this to dry before I do the last bits of it, which, as I said, was me going to um, come in and potentially dry brush this because this is a fabulous looking background, yes, but it's going to be way, way, way too bright for what I want. I don't want to distract from whatever I put on top of it. And what I'm going to do for the thumbnail for this actual video is I will use this as a background and I think I'm just going to put a camera on it so you can see the effect of what it would be with an item on top of it. Because if I photograph this and just use this as a thumbnail, it wouldn't make any sense in the video. Right, where am I up to? Right, let's just lift this up and see if I can move this. So. If you get motion sickness, please be aware, I'm going to move this down so you can all see the entire length of it. Okay, so I'm going to pause the video for a couple of seconds. Okay guys, it's, it's not fully dry, but it's dry enough to run my hand over. I've had the hairdryer on it for about 10 minutes. Um, it's dry enough for the next bit. I've also moved the camera up a bit because now that I'm no longer pasting, as you can see, it's almost in shot. I can't go any higher because there's nothing higher to attach it to. So my next step, oh, I also went around and I used a blade to actually just trim off the excess that was hanging over the sides, obviously. Word of warning, if you're using a blade, please be careful. So now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take some white gesso. Um, this is just inexpensive white gesso. And I'm going to come in with my finger. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come in and in certain areas, just lighten things up a bit. Now I've got no rhyme or reason why I'm doing it. It just softens some of those edges and pushes it a bit more into the background. Now, I am going to be doing some dry brushing. I already know that. But what I'm sort of looking for is things that have got a really solid line like that down there. I want to try and just not so much blend. Well, I suppose it is blend it really, isn't it? I'm just taking, taking the harshness of that out. And I'm, why am I using white gesso and not paint? I'm using white gesso because white gesso isn't isn't fully opaque, or at least this brand isn't, and you'll find that white gesso, when it dries, is it sort of gives um, a softened effect. It, it's not fully fully white, is what I'm trying to get at. Hopefully you'll see in the finished finish piece. So I'm just trying to blend out some of those really harsh edges between light and dark. Just a personal preference. I mean, as I said, you can do anything you want. It's it's yours to do with. I just like to give it some interest. But as you can see, comparing one half to the other half, it already doesn't look as 
predominantly in your face, which is we don't we don't want to hang this on our wall. We want to hang our featured things on it in an image. So I do hope this video is making sense because listening to myself, I'm like, I'm probably confusing everyone here. But we'll see what it sounds like when I actually edit it. I, I tend not to edit too much. I only usually take out the boring bits or the repeated processes or things from my videos because I know from a lot of you, you like the fact that I keep things real as in almost real time as much as I can where feasible. Um, and also if there's a mistake, I'll leave it in here. Now there is one thing I'm really happy about that I, I was a little bit worried about doing this is I thought maybe putting um, the matte gel medium on here that this might bow again with the moisture but obviously putting the clear gesso down meant that it actually sealed it off as well so I haven't got any of that bowing which is what I was slightly worried about as I said. Now, yes, you could use a paintbrush for this, but you know what? These are the perfect things. I, I can just wash my hands afterwards. It's not going to be a problem. Heck, <laughs> I'm covered in paint on a regular basis, uh, so I'm not worried about that. So, yeah, but I, do, I do encourage you to explore creating your own backgrounds for your photographs. It doesn't need to be this big. It depends on what sort of projects you normally create. Now, if you're a journaler and your journals are, let's see, what, the, what would they be? They'd probably be no more than nine inches by six inches, your finished journal. A, a, a regular journal. Let's, let's not slam Kerry for assuming all journals are the same size. I know they're not. But the standard journal people make, which is normally um, almost the size of a folded piece of copier paper. So you're about an A5. So somewhere around there. I mean, you don't need this size. You could probably do with something that, say, a 12 by 12 or something. You could make a 12 by 12 background. And very often the gel prints I make um, on my 12 by 12 gel plate, um, I do use them for smaller projects for photographing up against. So I think we're done with... Oh, there's one little bit there. Let me see how you can. So... So as I said, the, the white gesso will dry slightly transparent. So we're done with that. Time to give my fingers a bit of a wipe. And then we're going to go on and we're going to use some dry brushing techniques. Now, what do I mean by dry brushing technique for those who don't normally do dry brushing? Um, I take an old battered decorating brush. You can use something like this. And any brush will do. It's more about the technique. I mean, I see people do smaller things with a fan brush. It's more about the technique, not about the equipment. OK, um, I also bring in I, I have a glue book that I use for this. Um, I can equally do this on kitchen towel or kitchen paper. And what I do is I want to put a little bit of white paint on here, brush most of it onto here, and then dry brushing means I'm not adding water to this. So I'm going to put a bit of this paint onto my ceramic tile. And you may notice that some of this is already beginning to dry and dry a bit clearer. Like this, this I believe is where we started. And see this almost transparent look to it? That's what Jessa will do. Now, I'm not going to go overboard on this, I just want areas. So I'm going to dip my paintbrush in, give it a brush really well, and then come in and just brush over the top. And what it will do is it will catch any raised texture, which will give this interest. Because remember, I've said it a hundred times already, this is a background. Now I'm going to do half of this and then show you the difference between one half and the other half. Now, I'm using white. You could use whatever colour you wish. And once this is finished, I may look and go, this needs another colour. So, right, this is the side that's been dry brushed. This is the side that hasn't. So hopefully you can see, see between the two. I mean, I love this side, but it's for a photograph and it's for the background. So therefore, I don't want it to be too dominant. 
So again, get the excess off, give it a bit of a dry brush. This is why I didn't mind the wrinkles, because the wrinkles give me texture. Texture then catches the paint, and it gives me something really interesting to look at. As I said, you can do this with any colour you choose. I think we may be finished. So guys, I hope you enjoyed that little experiment, little tutorial. Um, I'm Kerry the Crafter, that's C-E-R-I the Crafter. And do have a go at this, make your own unique backgrounds. They're simple to do, they're easy to do. You don't need to mount them on card. You can just find wallpaper samples or paper samples, or even go to a charity shop and get one of those canvas arts that you find in the recycle bin and buy it for maybe a pound or a dollar or two and just paint over the top of that and make make something that makes your thumbnail stand out amongst the others. So I'm Kerry the Crafter, that's C-E-R-I the Crafter. Until next time, bye bye now.